Our speaker this evening is Mark Jacobs. Mark is the director of Split Rock Conservation Park in Petersburg. <coughs> After completing a Bachelor of Science degree in Anthropology from Northern Kentucky University and an associate degree in Recreation and Wildlife Management from Hawking Technical College, he started his career in conservation in the captive wildlife field. Mark worked at the Louisville Zoo, Kings Island Wild Animal Habitat, and the wilds in southeastern Ohio, where he was the director of animal management. Upon his return to northern Kentucky in 2001, Mark founded Wildlife Conservation Kentucky Incorporated and started Split Rock Conservation Park. He is also the conservation technician for Boone and Kenton County Conservation Districts, and he currently lives at Split Rock Conservation Park with his wife, Julie, and daughters, Grace and Maggie. Mark, welcome, and thank you for speaking with us. Thank you. Appreciate it. Absolutely. <laughs> so enjoy the opportunity to be here. Um, hopefully you'll enjoy this. Um, I, know, I know many of you have probably heard of Split Rock. I'm sure some of you have played down there and jumped off the rock and picnic and do whatever you do. We have a lot of uh, lifelong residents here in Boone County. From here. Absolutely. Excellent. I guess that's why you're here, huh? Um, but I think, I think you guys will spe especially enjoy this. Um, if you've spent any time down there, or, um, I, I think you'd like to see what, uh, what we're doing and, and things that the, the area has gone through. So, of course, Split Rock, the uh, geological formation is what it's known for, which is very unique in the area. It's about the only place like this on the Ohio River. Um, so for ever since people have been in the Ohio Valley, they've been attracted to the area. And there's evidence of that through archaeological evidence on the, on the plateaus around there. Um, but it's just an extremely unique place. Um, um, and, and of course, our organization is Wildlife Conservation Kentucky. That's kind of the, the corporate nonprofit name. We are a 501c3 um, private nonprofit organization. Um, and, and Split Rock is the park. Uh, uh, we developed that nonprofit ent entity to run the park and just promote conservation in general. And uh, this is a this is a, a, a <coughs> photo of the park, and, and I don't know if you guys really know this area very well. It's almost right smack in the middle between Petersburg and Bellevue, right on the Ohio River, which is Western Boone County's, uh, in my opinion, the, the nicest, prettiest place in Northern Kentucky, and, and even you know it even compares to a lot of other areas in Kentucky as well. It's extremely beautiful. It's about right in the middle of about sixty thousand contiguous acres of forest which is unbelievable, seeing we're about 30 minutes from downtown Cincinnati. So um, it's really a gem down there. And, and I'm lucky enough to have Split Rock, which is right in the middle of all that. So um, that's the park. And, and, a, and a lot of you might recognize the big S curve. That is Whooper Creek. So we're right at the mouth of the Whooper Creek watershed, um, which is a great aquatic resource. And that's a view of, of where Whooper Creek goes into the Ohio River. Uh, which is still beautiful. It's pretty much undisturbed, which is amazing since this was the site of a, of a large marina development in the late 80s or early 90s. Any of you remember that? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So uh, hopefully yeah. this talk will be interactive. Yeah, too. I, I remember that. Yeah, I don't want to sit up here and talk at you. So if you have any questions or want to discuss something, I'm absolutely game for it. Um, but you can already see some evidence of the glacial activities. That, uh, you're looking straight across it. Indiana, and that is the mouth of Lothry Creek, that scoured out bowl, and that was formed when the, the last glacier that came down the Wisconsin Glacier scoured that scoured that creek valley out like that. And of course, the you know the famous um, glacial conglomerate Split Rock um, is really known as two boulders that sit on the river. So anybody that's traveled the river in the last twelve or fourteen thousand years has probably seen it. Um, very unusual. Um, and of course, that is a, and we'll talk a little bit about that more, but of course, that's a, a deposit from the Illinois Glacier, supposedly about 130 to 300,000 years old. And, and by the way, um, right down from there, on the other side, on the other side of the mouth of Wilbur Creek is, they call that Kirby Rock. And if you've ever been down that area, you'll see an orange marker on it. That is the 500-mile marker on the Ohio River, which, does anybody know how long the Ohio River is? 800 times. What's that? 800 times. I think it's 989 miles long. You know, I guess it depends on if it ever moves or not. If it does occasionally, I think. But, but so we're really right smack in the middle of the Ohio Valley. Um, so really, the mission of, of Wildlife Conservation Kentucky is, uh, 
course, to develop when we when I came back to town was to develop Split Rock um, for a oriented outdoor conservation um, learning facility. So we wanted to provide an opportunity for, for children, and really people of any age, to come and learn about your own community, the natural resources in your own community. That was kind of a pet peeve of mine. It's kind of really why I left the, the zoo field, because of, you know, for 15 years, you know, I was seeing a lot of resources and conservation go to other countries, and none of the zoos really had any conservation, local conservation programs. You know, they, they like the big sexy stuff, you know, rhinos and giraffes and, you know, saving wildlife from Africa, but but nobody really really paid much attention to our local wildlife resources. So that was kind of part of my motivation. And I love walking out in the woods and learning stuff. So a um, <laughs> little, little self-interest there as well. Um, but we also uh, wanted to actively engage in projects to restore and enhance the local native biological diversity. Um, and, and I'll go into that a little bit more as we go to the presentation. Um, we want to promote the appreciation of wildlife heritage and good land stewardship. You know, how do you take care of the land in an appropriate way? Um, and we also want to encourage some community involvement. And we do that by, I think, we try to be, um, have events down there occasionally. We have an open house for people to come down and look around once a year. Um, we are a site for um, the river sweep every year. This year I couldn't do it because I had a conflict, but that was the first time in, in seven years we couldn't. But every, about every year we'll do that. And we'll, you know, people come down and help clean up the river bank because God knows it needs it sometimes. Um, is anybody familiar with Aldo Leopold? I highly recommend that. In fact, the, in fact, the Boone County Library can help promote uh, that book. He wrote a book. He was really kind of the, the father of um, modern conservation, really. The guy was years ahead of his time. Um, and he... Uh, he, he, really, he really lived what he talked about as far as conservation. Um, in, in one of his quotes, we abuse land because we re regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a commodity to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. So that's really what it's all about. It's using your natural resources uh, with respect and so, something. I think it, in the news lately, you've seen a lot about California and the water issues out there. And that's a perfect example. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that out there, and it's generally because our poor use of natural resources. Uh, again, one of the one of the um, really attractive features down at Split Rock, it's not just the glacial formation. It's a it's a whole lot of things. There's a lot of aquatic resources around there. It's right where the, um, um, Wolper Creek and the Ohio River join. There's we've got ponds and wetlands down on the property. Um, of course, the Ohio River, which is beautiful view all the time. This time of year is probably the best. Late summer, early fall, especially during the week when there's no boats down there. Sometimes it's just glass flat and it's peaceful and quiet. The sunsets down there are just rival anywhere. I've been around quite a bit as well. I've been able to travel a little bit and I know some of you have, but and I know some of you probably know our sunsets and our, our, uh, um, some of our natural areas around here rival anywhere. And of course the, the Geological formation. This is the area. Does anybody, any of you guys recognize some of this stuff? I got a few more photos that you might recognize a little bit better, but this is actually the part of the formation that you don't see from the river. Uh, you'll see two big rocks basically out in the river, but the foliage tends to cover everything else up. And this is really kind of like a little mini gorge back in there. So when we do uh, field trips down to Split Rock, we take a lot of um, all kinds, any age people. Um, we take them down into the, so they can see the formation and learn a little bit about um, how it was formed and, and uh, really sit in the middle. It's great, particularly for a kid, you know, about fourth or fifth grade, they start learning about geology. So it really beats sitting in a classroom looking at a textbook when you can sit right in the middle of a, a glacial conglomerate that's 300,000 years old. Uh, it makes a little bit more sense, I think. And of course, um, when we moved to the park, um, <coughs> You know, one of the main goals was to, to develop a conservation plan for the property. So right away, I, I didn't know enough to know that I don't know everything for sure. So I contacted as many people I, as I could that, that were knowledgeable about doing this sort of thing. So we contacted the NRCS, which is the Natural Resource Conservation Service. They're a federal um, resource agency, natural <coughs> resource agency. Uh, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, Division of Forestry, the local conservation district. And they helped me um, put together a plan to manage the property with our goals in mind, and that was basically to restore native biological diversity and, and manage it for wildlife. 
And one of the things we did was create um, or, or restore, depending on how you look at it, a wetland area in the bottom. That's actually right on the Ohio River there. And there's also um, a lot of cultural resources. My, my school background was in anthropology, and I have several really good buddies that are professional archaeologists. So that was kind of an easy thing to do is get them involved, and we actually have done some surveys out there. Uh, early on, found, found quite a bit of evidence of um, uh, village sites on the property, which really isn't surprising in Boone County down the wall, near the water. Um, but it's still interesting as part of our local heritage. Um, and also since then, I know Matt Becker from the Preservation Review Board has gotten grants and has, we've done a couple of surveys since then. The whole, most of the property has been surveyed, surveyed by now. So, and there is some, some of that published in some of the local archaeological publications, too, that probably are available at the library, I'm sure. Anybody recognize this? The last time I gave this, somebody gave me this slide. I think it was Mrs. Peely. Um, Peely Road, I think, of the Peely Road fame. Um, Catherine Peel. Pa Catherine Caddy Peel. Pe yeah, Cat Cat yeah, I think Cat that Cat one of those Cat is her. And I gave this at the library, I don't know, four or five years ago, and the other, one of the other girls that was there was in the audience, so. Um, that's always good. And she brought me some more photos. So if, if any of you guys run, ever run across any photos of Split Rock, I'd love to get a copy. Um, but this is in 1939. This was a, uh, apparently a local destination, as you, a lot of you know, um, for picnics and things like that. You know, it was very popular back to go back then. Um, and this was a high school graduation picnic in 1939. And this is a postcard that someone gave me. Now, if you, if you look at this photo, this is obviously before the dam was put in. So the rock formation, what's that, probably a 40 or 50 foot tall formation? What you see now is really the top third of that, you know, so the, the river pipe has been, uh, oh, you got something that's kind of different. Oh, okay. I might have it, see if I have that one as well. Is that the one, by any chance? That's it. There you go, isn't that neat? Wow. So, but that's, uh, every once in a while I'll, I'll you know, run into this. I love to collect the historical photos. It's excellent. And every once in a while I'll run into somebody who's been there and tell me good stories. So, um, anyway, it's, you know, the, the popularity of this area has been way back. From what I understand, back in, the, back in the day before there was air conditioning, people spent a lot of time on the river because it was cooler. And, of course, they'd come down the river and hit certain areas. I know me and a, a friend of mine used to go down, we used to read about that sort of thing. And, and we... Drennan Springs was another area that people would go from Cincinnati down the river up the Kentucky River to Drennan Springs, which had a um, gazebo. They had they had um, springs, mineral springs there that were real popular. Um, and this place now, I, I think there was actually a big resort there. Um, but if you go there now, it's a tiny little town. It's hard to find, but you can still see like gazebos back along the hills. I guess where was that a sulfur spring? Yeah, I think that was a sulfur spring area, kind of like Big Bone. Um, My mom and dad used to go there and get sulfur water. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So, again, there's another example. I love these old photos. Um, I think that must have been after the dam was built. So that must have been, what, the late 40s, maybe? After late, when was the dam built? 49, something like that? Uh, 63. 63 was 63 when the water the Markland, came out. So that's the Markland Bulls or the Markland Dam? Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. <coughs> Yeah, very interesting. So, um, and I've ran into quite a few people. I got actually got this photo from Matt Becker. This was the original farmhouse. Now, the, now on the 1883 atlas of Boone County, um, it says the Frank Hartman residence. So there's still remnants of these of the homestead there. There's a um, now there's kind of a pit in the side yard that I just let, I call it a garden. A lot of people would call it weeds, but. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Uh, but there's still, you can see the stone that was laid. It was probably the, the cellar of the, of the old house. And the old barn is actually still there. The foundation had burnt down about a year before I moved in, unfortunately, because it was beautiful. The, the guy before that lived there, that owned the property before, had restored the barn for unscrupulous reasons. Um, but it was beautiful, and the, and the, the stonework and the, and the foundation was just beautiful with arches and things like that and it's still there it's dangerous because it's kind of crumbling because of the fire but uh, it's it's still there we have no intention of getting rid of it and I dream of restoring it someday but I, you know, I can't imagine that happen um, but anyway um, since since we took over um, we, we wanted people to have access to these 
uh, incredibly unique areas. So um, I took a whole first year when I moved back to town um, and developed a trail system and kind of got, got the place on the road. So uh, we have about probably about two miles of trails. Um, and, the point, and the point really is to, to get people to these areas so they can really see and enjoy um, some of these different habitats and locations. Um, and of course the motivation in northern Kentucky is we're one of the fastest growing areas in, probably in the country. Um, and so, so we've lost a lot of our, our natural, really nice natural areas. Um, so we tend to get a lot of urban sprawl. The, the forest looks pretty rough there, doesn't it? <laughs> so, What's that picture of? That, that is, I think that area is, I think that's over in Independence area. But that could be anywhere in Northern Kentucky. Yeah, they really could. Um, it's not I think Petersburg, I particularly think. Boone County is, is, is growing fast. As you all know, I think in the last 15 or 20 years, it's doubled in population. Um, most of it's been kept up here in the east, but... You know, it's not going to be long until it starts spilling over. And the, and the, and the things that, why, don't, why am I showing this photo? Well, the things that when we do, the way we build and the way we do things is really what's creating a lot of the problems that we have now. Flooding and water pollution and loss of forest, the fragmentation, loss of wildlife, things like that. This is an excellent example of when you remove the forest and you cover it with asphalt, and anything that the rain has nowhere to go, so all of our streams are blown out around here. They're all polluted, um, mostly. So, um, you know, we really need to maybe do things a, a different way. And I'm certainly not saying that you should never develop. I mean, I mean, absolutely, you're never going to stop that. But um, there are there are other other things to consider. You know, we really need to consider our natural resource base as a priority when we plan and develop our community. Um, and of course. Um, this is the result of, of some of the things we do. That is actually a stream going through one of our parks. That's Boone Woods. Um, when that's just the stuff you can see on top. Mm -hmm. so, um, and actually right now, NKU Center for Applied Ecology is restoring that stream. So, and they just started that. So if you take a spin back to Boone Woods and go down to the back parking lot where the Frisbee area is, they're, um, they're restoring that stream right now. Um, and unfortunately, we learned too late because it costs hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to fix this stuff, and it probably would have cost you nothing but, but a few acres along the stream to, to prevent it. And of course, also, also when we move into areas and build roads, we disturb a lot of um, areas. And of course, we get things like bush honeysuckle, um, non-native invasive species that move in, um, honeysuckle vine. Those are the two most prominent around here. But also, that's where um, the chestnut blight came from, which was chestnut trees were magnificent trees, a quarter of the forest in the eastern deciduous forest, gone in 100 years because of a disease brought in from Asia. Um, the emerald ash borer is the newest wave that's coming. That'll probably take out most of our ash trees in the forest around here. Um, so, but split rock, again, the point of split rock was to hopefully have an area for people to come, particularly children, because they just have nowhere to go anymore. Um, they spend most of their time probably in front of the TV or the computer or out on the soccer field, but when I was a kid, I was lucky enough, my granny had a little farm down on Turkey Foot Road, so just a few miles from our house, so we, I was lucky enough to spend a lot of time outside. Um, but kids just don't have that opportunity anymore, so, so, you know, really the way this came about was, I've been thinking about this for a long time, and I happened to run into, um, I've known about Split Rock for many years. Me and my goofy buddy used to get topo maps out and explore. So we got a little John boat and got in, in Petersburg at the landing there. We had no idea where we were going. To, uh, we were city boys from Edgewood. So <laughs> we explored and we were looking for the Indian Mound was, was actually what we were looking for, which was nowhere near where we were looking. But we ran across Split Rock and actually there is burial grounds in Petersburg. Oh, there's plenty of them, absolutely. Yeah. That person yeah. wanted to build that house down there, yeah. and he dug found it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I got some yeah. photos of that, by the way. That was excellent. Saw. I got to participate in that. So, and actually, I got to take my daughter down in there, and there was half exhumed bodies everywhere. She got a big kick out of that. So. <laughs> uh, but, but anyway, you know, Split Rock was the perfect place, and, and Dr. Dave Quast, actually, he's an orthodontist from Edgewood, actually owns the property now. Um, the property in the late 80s, early 90s was, was owned by a guy named um, Stites, who was going to develop that marina down there. And, and I don't know if a lot of you probably still remember that hole. That was kind of a big uproar in the local area. And it was going to be 350 boat slips down there and condominiums all up and down there. It would have ruined the whole place. And, but the guy was a 
Uh, he ended up in jail. <laughs> he probably Since I'm on camera, I'll, I'll keep my comments to that. We'll talk later. But there's some good stories. Whether they're true or not, I don't know. There's probably some building good another distillery. <laughs> it's something, yeah. There was a big distillery there. Yeah, that's right. So, so Dr. Quast um, um, acquired the property, and I kind of ran into him at church one day and kind of pitched the idea to him. He said, well, we'll talk. And we worked it out. And Dave is actually my, his sister is married to my brother. And uh, which really had nothing to do with anything. It was fortunate for me because I knew him. So, um, but uh, Split Rock just happens to be one of the best places for this. And uh, I've been wanting to do this for about a decade. So it, it really worked out. So it was just an, an outstanding spot to do that because of the resources that are there. So, and again, our, you know, our main goal really is, is to educate people about the, about the biodiversity and hopefully some of the things we will do will help restore some of the native biodiversity. So, which is the variety and variability among living organisms um, and the ecological complexes in which they occur. So, and it's very, very complex. So, so, you know, even the most insignificant critters, you know, there's absolutely a reason for them. Any of you guys ever ask, um, you know, what's the re you know, might as well just kill that thing. What's the point? What's the reason for that? That thing's good for nothing. I hear that all the time in the conservation field. But um, anybody familiar with E.O. Wilson? This guy is actually a, he's, he's a brilliant guy. There's a, he has a book called Naturalist, which is excellent. I highly recommend reading that. Um, but he's a, actually, the, I think he runs the entomology department at Harvard. Um, brilliant guy. And uh, of course, humanity is part of nature. A species that evolved among other species. The ethical imperative should therefore be, first of all, prudence. We should, every scrap of biodiversity is priceless while we learn to use it and to come to understand what it means to humanity. So the guy, the guy was absolutely brilliant. So, um, and again, the point of that is really just because we don't understand something doesn't mean it's worthless. Um, it absolutely is, is, is very valuable, even the tiniest creatures. Um, so the aquatic resources, again, down Split Rock are probably my favorite part of it because of the diversity that's down there. And we built this wetland here. This was an old cornfield that it, it laid very wet, I think, all the time. And in good seasons, they would get a good crop out of it. The soil's probably great for that. But there was always, you know, sometimes it would be wet. You couldn't get your crop out or you couldn't get it in in time. So, um, so we, we uh, always had in mind to, to maybe restore that. And if you look at the 1883 atlas, there is no curve in Split Rock. I don't know why. Or, or in Wolver Creek, but there is a, a pond there. It was probably an old oxbow lake, so it was probably a natural wetland at one time that was drained for agriculture. Um, it was easy to drain because it was right there on the creek. So, um, so basically, all we did was plug the plug the little ditch that was there, and in the spring we'll get about four acres, four surface acres of water. And, and wetlands, of course, are probably one of the the most endangered habitats in Kentucky. There's very little of it left, um, and it's kind of regretful because. It, cleans our water and you know holds flood water and all those things we kind of regret now um, especially if you live anywhere along a creek in a floodplain um, but of course there's some great animals down there too this is one of the one of the plentiful local denizens of Whooper Creek down there um, there's plenty of those down there in fact this time of year I can almost guarantee you seeing them in the evening um, during the summer there was you would go they would find you I guess they were having their pups so you take your kayak you do down in there they would show up and start splashing, and they'd kind of lead you, try to lead you away, and they'd go down the creek, and then they'd disappear, and they'd be back here. Exactly. What is that? That's a beaver. So a lot of people, a lot of people don't even realize these exist around here. And they're absolutely plentiful in most of the creeks down along the Ohio River. But in fact, the bank of the river, half a mile of split rock, there's cut, cut willows all up and down the bank. There's plenty of them down there. And of course, the, the, the waterfowl, um, since we put that wetland in, it's a great, uh, great area for the waterfowl to come. And certain times of year, it's nothing to walk into the wetland and jump 50 or 60 or 70 ducks of different kinds up. We've got, since we built this, and again, it's only been five years. Um, we've had mergansers nests there and, and wood ducks. And we have harriers that fly over. Um, we've had eagles, um, cranes. Um, all kinds of unusual birds. Kathy, you know, Kathy can probably tell you more than I do. I think the local bird club comes down and doesn't count there every year, which I'm, I'm thankful for because it's always nice to know what's visiting your, your uh, land. And, yeah, it's a beautiful yeah. place to learn. It's very nice. Um, and of course, even the aquatic insects. You know, and these are the kind of creepy little things. What are they good for? Well, 
you know, this is what everything eats. This is what kind of helps keep the whole system moving. And of course, they turn into beautiful gems like that. That was actually a dragonfly larvae, so which lives part of their life cycle in an aquatic system, and the other part, they, of course, they they fly. That's a beautiful critter, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That color's something. Anybody know what these are? Have you ever seen anything like that? You ever hear of sea monkeys? You ever see those what little you say? sea monkeys? You ever hear of those? Kids used to get them, you mail, send them, send away for them. They send you a little yeah. packet, you put them in water, and these little yeah. these are actually fairy shrimp. And these and these things are interesting because they'll they'll exist in a in an ephemeral habitat, which is which is not permanent. You know, like our, our wetland here dries up. Right now it's it's dry as a bone out there. But this this animal will when it lays its eggs or sits, <coughs> it'll lay in this mud or in this dirt sometimes for, for years. And when it floods again, they'll hatch out and they'll be uh, these little shrimp-like creatures, which of course are part of the food chain and feed a lot of things. And last, last year in the winter, um, it was, it was a real cold, real cold, and there was a lot of snow on the ground this past winter. There was about five or six inches of snow on the wetland back there, and, and uh, my son, daughter says there's a hole back there, so I walked back there. And there must have been thousands of these things bubbling out of the, this hole in the wetland. It was unbelievable. So I made a little video of it one of these days, so maybe I'll send it to the library or something. <laughs> but it was unbelievable, and they were just kind of, it was like a symphony. They were kind of dancing. And, uh, very interesting. Anybody know what this guy is? Salamander. Do you know what kind? No. This is um, uh, this is in a family called Ambistema. These are um, woodland salamanders, but they but they and they live out in the forest, and you, you usually don't see them that often because, of course, not many people roll over logs out in the middle of the forest. But but they come, they migrate to these uh, um, little wetland pools in the forest. You know, so if you have a farm with an old decrepit cattle pond that's you know all full of leaves. Those are outstanding areas for for these um, amphibians. These are great breeding areas for them. So they'll migrate to these little pools and they'll lay their eggs and, and their, their larvae will live in there for, for several months until they come back and move back out into the forest. So um, one of the luck we're lucky enough to have a little pond out in the forest and uh, just every every spring I'll take my daughter down there and we'll do little surveys and try to take some photographs. So she absolutely loves it. You ever see one of these? These are very common around here too, if you have the right habitat. This is a, it's a eastern red spotted newt. And these are interesting too because they'll, they'll also breed in these pools, but they have a part of their life cycle, um, their land phase when they're terrestrial, they're, they're bright red and they're called a red eft. So they'll live for a couple of years out in the forest as this little red salamander, and then they'll, they'll change into this more green, bigger, they'll get that paddle tail and they'll go in, into the uh, pond and, and breed. Absolutely amazing. I wish I should, in, I should have a, a picture of the red app. I'll get one and put it in there. But uh, this is one of my favorites here too. These are uh, spring peepers. Surely some of you country folk have heard these in the spring. It's the first thing here in the spring. Tree um, yes, they are. They're not a true tree frog, but yeah, they, they are a terrestrial frog. They live out in the vegetation. They do not live in ponds. They only go there to breed, and they're first thing in the spring. You'll hear that. Of course, 10,000 of them are very loud. So, um, but they'll get their, their little bag under their chin. If you've ever watched them, it's, it's pretty incredible. But uh, um, they'll come to these aquatic habitats by the hundreds or thousands as well. Recognize him? Some people think they're ugly. I think they're absolutely gorgeous. They're, uh, Wouldn't want to be you on a dark night. That, that, is the, that is the American toad. There are two kinds of toads around here, a Fowler's toad and an American toad. And if you look at this one's back, you see there's lumps on his back? Mm -hmm. And they're inside spots. On an American toad, there'll be a, one or two lumps in there. And a Fowler's toad will have five or six, and they're a little bit more green looking. But, but they make a beautiful call in the spring when they, when they breed. They only come, of course, toads live on in the forest, you know, or in, out in the landscape on the land. They particularly like nice sandy soil, which Split Rock is because of the glaciers, and they, they come in mass to these little ponds, and, and uh, it's, a pretty, it's something to see for about a week. Um, um, but they're the next kind of phase of amphibian that comes to these aquatic habitats. Um, and then after that, the cricket frogs come, and these guys are about, they're about as big as your thumb. Most of these frogs are tiny. Um, 
and they, they almost look kind of like uh, halfway between a frog and a, and a toad. Of course, you see the little spots on their back, and they tend to get those bright green spots. They blend right in with the moss, um, and they sound like they're a cricket frog, and they sound like somebody tapping marbles together. And again, 10,000 of them are real loud. <laughs> This is one, this is my favorite. This is a Cope's gray tree frog. And everybody has probably seen them. You, at your house, you might see them when you put the lights on in the summer and the insects come and you might find one sticking to your window or hanging on your house. But they kind of have a sound that sounds like a bird almost. And, you, and in the spring, you can almost hear them migrating through the trees, through the wetland. And then one day they'll be in the wetland and there'll be just bunches of them. And uh, that's, that's one right in, in mid-song there. Um, so that's kind of the next wave of amphibian, and then, then you start getting into the true frogs kind of towards summer. That's a, a pickerel frog, and of course there's green frogs and bullfrogs. So that's, you know, that's just a, an example of the diversity of life in this one little wetland in one little tiny part of Bend County, Kentucky. Um, this is, and of course the reason, the whole reason for them going there is to reproduce, and these are actually toad eggs. And toads lay long strings of eggs that, that almost look like DNA. And they'll lay thousands and thousands of them. And the next phase, of course, is um, when they hatch are these little tiny black tadpoles. And sometimes you'll see like clouds of thousands of them at a time in these in these pools. It's really something to see. And, and eventually, when they, of course, um, start metamorphizing into a, a more mature-looking frog, there'll be there'll be hundreds and thousands of these little teeny tiny toadlets that start coming out of the water and they'll start spreading through the ground. So I have to be very careful with the children at that time. We can't walk in certain areas because they're just everywhere. So, and of course, but of course, all these are doing this around the same time, all through spring, all those different species. These are, these are uh, spring peeper, little baby spring peepers that have just left the wetland and, and sometimes you'll find them on the, on the flowering plants, sitting on the leaves and they might sit by the flowers and wait for the insects to come by. And, uh, there might be, I've seen as many as maybe six or eight or ten on one plant um, sitting there. A lot of times you don't no rec notice them, you just think they're crickets or grasshoppers or something, or some kind of insect, but a lot of them are frogs. And of course, you ever see one of these yeah. around here? Soft shell, spiny soft shell, <laughs> which we see them quite a bit down on the creek. This is a little green hair, and now we, have, now we start getting into the predators, you know, so you have this whole, whole again, a food web going on. Of course, we see these quite, quite a bit, and even the, their bigger cousin, the great blue heron, quite a few of those down on Wolfer Creek. It's just excellent habitat for them. So that's where, when the, frog, the little frogs have to be careful here. So then, of course, one of our, one of our um, areas that we really try to get the kids into is the forest. Uh, does anybody know what forest we live in? Have any idea? What forest we live in? What type of forest do we live in? Been living here all our lives. We always lived in the woods. You lived in the woods? <laughs> That's right. What's the difference between the forest and the Well, as a, you know, like the rainforest in the Amazon. Actually, actually, we live in the eastern deciduous forest. If you want to get real technical, it's really the, the western mesophytic forest, which is kind of the west side of the eastern forest, a broadleaf temperate forest. And it's one of the, I think it's the second largest, most biologically diverse forest in the world besides the rainforest. So, and we live in Kentucky, particularly in, in eastern Kentucky in the Appalachians. That is the epicenter for the eastern forest, which is just an incredible ecosystem. Um, and we kind of live right in it. We're actually very lucky. So no matter where you're standing, you're right in the middle of a, a huge forest. And a thousand years from now, this, is, this will probably be a big mature forest. Um, of course, in the, in the critters that live in the forest, a whole different variety of, of animals might utilize that habitat. Of course, squirrels, um, the woodpeckers, a huge variety of birds <coughs> like to stick to the forest. That's a red-bellied woodpecker, is that correct, Candy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a red-headed red-headed. Um, no, red-headed's got a red. solid red-headed. Uh, um, all yeah. the whole head. They're kind of a wetland bird. They, don't they like stick yeah. up out of the wetlands and things like that? Um, any snake lovers in here? Any snake haters in here? <laughs> Am I going to have to turn back to the E.O. Wilson slide? <laughs> no. This is actually, this is a beautiful, kids love snakes. It's usually adults that ruin children. 
when I have groups of, it's always the teachers and the parents that run to the back, the back of the, the crowd and the kids swarm you. So that's definitely a learned behavior. So. Uh, but this is actually a beautiful, we find a lot of these down there and they, they tend to like, this is, they kind of like the forest. They like, like moist soil under logs. And, and this snake is only, when they're biggest, they're about that big. This is called a ringneck snake. And they're great for kids to learn because they're absolutely harmless. Even if they bit you, which I've never even seen one ever bite, I've handled hundreds of them. And I've never even had one try to bite me. And they're, they're just beautiful, shiny gray, uh, bright yellow ring around its neck, or orange, bright orange, and its belly's bright orange. So it's excellent for the kids to kind of touch and hold and kind of get used to something that they're really not familiar with. When I was a kid, it would be nothing to jump on a big black snake. And my dad was kind of like that as well. But but, but uh, the way some of these parents are now, it's kind of actually pretty ugly. <laughs> I have some you can't even look at it. They have to run away and look the other way. So, um, and again, this is a toad in the land. That's actually a big female. Um, and look at the colors on her. That's, I didn't doctor that photograph either. She, she's about that big. Females tend to be bigger than males. And they're voracious insect eaters as well. Of course, the wildflower displays are pretty good down Split Rock. There's, there are some, in Boone County, there are certain areas that have outstanding wildflower displays, and that alone is enough to protect some of these, some of these forested areas, particularly along, along, around some of these bigger watersheds. River Creek and Middle Creek has excellent wildflower dis displays down the bottoms. Gunpowder does as well. Um, Big Bone, uh, they all do. Um, so it's really important to protect those riparian areas, those areas along waterways, those forested areas, because that's what's protecting our water. That's what harbors a lot of different species, um, corridors for animals. Is anybody, any wildfire enthusiasts in here? That last one was a, a, a nodding trillium. I used to know what it was, but the ones I saw was red. Red, oh yeah, there's toad shade. We have quite a few of those down here. Toad shade or, or sessile trillium is a, is a red one. That, is down there. This is squirrel corn. Does that look like a Dutchman cricket? They're they're real similar, absolutely. Yeah. This one this one is squirrel corn. Uh, leaf on the yeah, Dutchman's britches looks looks more leg yeah. leg like. But, the, um, the, but yeah, these are these are some of the, the prettiest spring wildflowers. Um, anybody know what this one is by any chance? Jack and That's wild ginger. Mm -hmm. And I kind of pulled the flower up a little bit so oh. you can see it, but generally that flower is kind of hidden under the leaves and lays on the ground. And from what I understand, it's pollinated by ants. <laughs> so, and they do, it smell, when you dig the root up, it, it's, it's ginger. You know, I would imagine you could cook with it. Or... <coughs> and this is a real common one down there. This tends to grow in the edge of the woods, just inside the edge of the woods by the hundreds. And this is a zigzag spiderwort, and they get about that tall. Oh, yeah. So right about midsummer they bloom, and there'll be hundreds of them through the forest. Funguses are my new, one of my new favorites. There's so many different fungus. This is a coral fungus. A lot of different varieties of fungus out there. I think that's a turkey tail. Isn't that pretty? Good colors on that. You ever see one of these things? No. That's an elegant stink horn. Isn't that bizarre? Does it stink? Uh, it smells weird. I wouldn't say it stinks, but it definitely has a weird, yeah, that definitely gives off a weird aroma. Like a real weird, strong, musty, sweet kind of smell. Yeah, it's a bit bizarre. Anybody know what that one is? Some of you old timers should know what this one is. That's a mushroom. That's a, that's a morel. That's a delicacy. If you have a patch of these, don't tell anybody where it is. These are the best eating mushroom around, I think. Sauteed in butter, a little olive oil. Yeah, delicious. With some bluegill fillets, it's outstanding. <laughs> of course, um, now we're getting into some of the insects. Um, this is a morning cloak butterfly, and this is one of the first butterflies you'll see in the spring around the forest around here. These, these two, the next two, are actually there's a that's a red oak tree, and, and uh, there's some sap running out of it, so the butterflies were attracted to it. So, so they weren't they weren't startled by my camera. That's a, that's a very pretty forest butterfly. That's a northern pearly eye. Anybody know what those are? Mm -hmm. Anybody? Just shout it out. Caterpillars. Those are caterpillars. Some of you guys should know what this is. 
These are, th these are actually forest tent caterpillars. There's eastern tent caterpillars. Those are the ones that make the webs. Oh, and, they, yeah. and they like um, species in the prunus genus, or in the genus prunus, which are wild black cherry. That's their mm -hmm. favorite food. Uh -huh. These guys like, and they'll eat every leaf on a cherry tree. Um, but guess what? They, the trees in the forest have been dealing with them for thousands of years, so the trees recover and everything's okay. They're not the horrible pests that everybody makes them out to be. In fact, every kid should see a, an infestation of, of tent caterpillars. Now, this one is a little bit different. This is a forest tent caterpillar, and they like uh, maples and oaks, and they'll actually drop out of trees with like on a, on a single strand. And I've, I've actually been in a forest a couple years ago right down in Gunpowder where thousands of them were coming out of the trees. And you can hear their poop rain through the trees like rain. It was unbelievable. And they'd get on your hair and all over your back. And every kid should get to see something like that. But the, the, the forest recovers, you know. And probably a lot of animals really benefit from that. That's a huge food source. And I don't know if you've ever noticed in a year where there's a lot of tent caterpillars, you see a lot of these big flies around. Notice that next time. And uh, those flies are actually parasitic on caterpillars. So you know you might have these population booms where you have big, big booms that you know eat up all the trees. But then you know a couple years later, they'll just be normal. They'll always be around, but you know they go through these population fluctuations. You know the forest has a way of taking care of itself. That thing's about that long and about that big around. Well, he's weird looking. He is weird looking. That is a that is a um, hickory horn devil. Hickory horn devil, right? You know what he turns into? Hickory horn moth. Or <laughs> yeah, a regal moth. Yeah, that big, big, big. big beautiful oh. horns. Big beautiful moths. Yeah, but the thing's completely harmless. It looks horrible. In fact, I got a great. I should put the one with my daughter. I put it on her shirt. Oh, she looks like she's gonna have a breakdown. <laughs> they, they're, Is that native to this area? Yeah, absolutely, yes, sir. There's some great, there's some great caterpillars around here as well. Luna moths and horn devils and polyphemus moths and they're, man, they're big and giant and they're neat looking. Kids love them. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You ever see one of these? Yeah. yeah. A woodcock. Timber doodle. Mer yeah, timber doodle. American woodcock. Do you ever see one display? These guys will, the, the males will stake out territories. Kathy, jump in here if you see, hear anything inconsistent. But they, I guess they kind of like these open areas. They're kind of like grassy areas. Yeah. And with opening, kind of like, I don't know if the vegetation's low, or maybe you, I've even seen them in kind of heavily rocky areas. And they'll, and they'll kind of march or dance around or march around, and they'll, and they'll make this pinking noise, pink, pink. And then they'll fly up in a big spiral, and you'll hear like, I guess it's their wings. That's great. That's really good. Yeah. I got some. Big, I've spent many hours watching the weird things, but and you can and when they fly up, you can actually run there and sit down in the vegetation, and they they really don't pay much attention to you if you're quiet. And they'll land back down and they'll do the same thing over and over again. It's absolutely um, bizarre. It's interesting. And I, we've even done it in, when we were in school. We had 20 students sit around and run around and sit around a singing field, and they just do their thing, go about their thing. So. I actually got some video of this guy too. I'll get that to watch. <laughs> you ever see one of these? This thing's about a foot long. I've never seen one of these until I moved the split drop. And I always thought, man, I knew they were there because I was always looking through my field guides and thinking, like, man, one thing before I die, I want to see a broad headed skink. And they're like rats down there. Forever. A broad headed skink. This is actually a mature breeding male. Skink. Skink, yeah. S K I N K. And um, there, you see them all the time through the summer. That, um, and they're arboreal. You'll see them a lot on the trees. Um, this guy is, is a, like I said, an adult breeding male. You know, they have that nice, almost gold color with a big, bright orange head. And, they're, and again, they're about that long. Um, the females are, are, are a little bit more camouflaged. They have stripes down their back and a little bit more. They blend in, you know. But the, the babies, up until they're juveniles, have these neon blue tails. So I guess, which is attracts predators. You know, if a tr predator tries to get it, you know, it'll go after that neon blue tail, and then the tail will break off, and the, and the animal will escape, and then regrow its tail. So um, you see those babies quite a bit. In the late summer, they'll start coming out and after they hatch out. And they like to lay, when it's sunny, they'll lay on the concrete right out in front of my, our building. So, 
<laughs> Excellent animal. Now we're going to go to the grass, the grassland areas of Split Rock. And, and again, the, the, the appeal to Split Rock is not just the rock formations, but we have all these interesting habitats, some, some we kind of nurtured back to, to the way that hopefully they were. Um, but we have nice native grasslands and forest land and wetlands and aquatic systems all kind of within this 165 acre parcel here. And, and this is really what a native Kentucky grassland should look like. It's not the mowed fields of European fescue that we see now, which is 90% of the grassland in Kentucky. Um, it's um, these big blue stem Indian grass. This is what the bison and elk ate. And, and, and if there was a disturbance in the forest around here before contact period, this would probably be a, a real early successional stage. You'd get these grasses to come in, then the you know some of the trees, shrubs and trees would start to grow and eventually grow back in the forest. And we're we're kind of close to that area where prairie meets the woodland. So in Kentucky, as you get down into the bluegrass, that was savanna, right? And some of it was maintained by human culture, some of it might be climactic, maybe it's you know real dry, maybe not a lot of rain, so trees can't grow, maybe it was soil issues. Um, but as you get down into western K Kentucky where the barrens were, where the more open grassland prairies were, and then of course out west where the big uh, prairies were. But you do, have, you do have some of this in Kentucky, these are all native Kentucky plants. Um, so, so when we moved there, every, everywhere, almost everywhere that was open meadow, we killed out all the non-native invasive plants as best we could, and we planted um, a variety of native tall grass prairie species, which we maintain, and we'll try to maintain that by fire as well. We'll burn it every few years. It keeps kind of the trees from encroaching, and it adds a lot of nutrients back into the soil. And, and a lot of the animals that utilize that are used to that. That's part of the, the ecological cycle. This is it in the fall. It's beautiful in the fall, so um, my, my place is very wooly. Split rock is very well. I don't like to mow. I mow one yard for people to come and kind of gather, but everywhere else is, is um, looks like this. I mow trails through it so people can get through it and get into the middle of it. But those nice big clump grasses are outstanding animal habitat for those animals that that, that um, utilize this kind of habitat. And of course, the the forbs or the flowering plants are a very important part of the grassland. This is um, wild bergamot. Um, Greyhound coneflower, great for attracting uh, pollinating insects, which of course we all depend on. And it's also great for cover for the wildlife. Actually, I've got this 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 spring. This walked upon this little fawn that was nestled down in the grass. Of course, that's the mist flower. That's actually blooming right now. If you go out to the meadows, right right around the wood edges this time of year. Um, excellent plant for attracting pollinating insects. Anybody recognize this one? It's actually kind of a small plant. You see this in the spring in the meadows. It's called a Venus's looking glass. Really pretty native flower. You know what that is? That's a clear wing moth. It's like mimics a bumblebee. It's a, a sphinx moth. I think some people consider them pests. I think sometimes they can fruit trees and things like that. But they'll hover, just like a, some, some call them a hummingbird moth. But they, they clearly mimic a bumblebee, I guess. Everybody should know what this one is. That's a worm. That's a worm. <laughs> that's a monarch, and that's on common milkweed. And the, when, I, when, when I was setting up the prairie at Split Rock, I hired one of the local farmers, and uh, I told him he was mo helping me mow to get everything ready, and I said, make sure you don't mow over my milkweed patch there. <laughs> so now to this day, I see him, and he still teased me about <laughs> that weed patch that they had to avoid. But they're beautiful flowers, and they get probably, probably of every type of flower out there, they'll grow in these sometimes big colonies. And, and in the spring, you can walk in the middle of them, and there might be a thousand bumblebees on there. And they don't care. They, they're not interested in you. They're just interested in collecting the nectar and, and things out of there. But there's many animals that will utilize that. That's a monarch butterfly larvae. Um, so not only do the, the larvae eat the plant, which makes them impalatable to, to a lot of predators because of the sap and the milkweed, um, but the adults also 
um, utilize the nectar and the flowers. And many bees, there's milkweed bugs, specifically called milkweed bugs, which are bright orange. Anything that's bright orange in nature, you tend to avoid. Because it'll either sting you or try to kill you or you eat it and it's poison. Or taste bad. <laughs> so that's kind of a warning sign. Um, that's a beautiful buckeye. That's a, a, fla a butterfly. That's a buckeye. Those are beautiful. That's on an aster. Too. There you go. There's a monarch. Mm -hmm. Actually, you should, you should, they, they're migrating this time of year, so I think sometimes you can see them sometimes in small groups around here. I don't think so much around here, but other areas they'll migrate by the hundreds or thousands. Spiders are another one of my favorites. <laughs> but the, that harmless, they're completely harmless. That's, a, that's some kind of flower spider or crab spider, which they'll sit on these, these flowers and ambush bees and butterflies and other insects that utilize the, the uh, flower. And of course, you know, the, the predators of those insects are the, the local birds. This is a uh, red-winged blackbird fledgling. It's just starting to explore. They, you know, usually you find these along a, in a wetland area. Um, in this particular area, it's a little pond right on the edge of the prairie. And of course, rabbits. Ra rabbits, the, the reason why we wanted to restore this grassland habitat was, was particularly animals like rabbits or quail that are, the populations have been declining drastically in the last few years. When's the last time you guys saw quail? Long time. It's been a long time. I remember it, it, back in my granny's house, and this is Lakeside Park. We used to hunt quail all the time, or my cousins, my older cousins did. Every Thanksgiving, they'd go out and shoot quail. Well, there aren't quail uh, over at uh, Whitewater River? What's that? Isn't there a lot of quail over in Whitewater District in Indiana? Um, hopefully, but I think even all over the southeast, the quail populations are going down, and the rabbit populations as well. You might see a couple around your house, but... My, my dad and brothers used to go out hunting and they would can it, get 80 or 90 rabbits and they, my grandma would can them and they'd eat them all winter. But well, they always said if you hunted quail, they stayed. And if you didn't hunt them, they would disappear. I think if you mow, they disappear. And if you don't mow, they stay. Is that the way it is? <laughs> yeah, it's the habitat. A lot of people say the coyotes are eating them all or the hawks are eating them all. That's, nah, that's garbage. It's, it's because the habitat's gone. The reason I ask you about them being in Indiana, the, the quail and mm -hmm. my uh, nephew, great nephew, had that show, Bodie Owens, Wildlife. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see that? I've heard of it, sure, yeah. yeah. And he would take groups out to shoot. I used to mm -hmm. see. Yeah. And he, people put fund in these programs, so he hasn't been on. Mm -hmm. well, he, well, back in the back in the day, I think, you know, these small family farms, you know, nobody had time to go out and mow everything from fence row to fence row. So fence rows grew up and, and you know, you had some crops there and some grown up fence rows and shrubs and things like that. And, and that's what these animals really like and that's what they lived in. And the prairie's gone and now that's gone. So you get these nice big clean horse farms out in the county and nothing can really grow. So since I put, I can tell you though, since we put this grassland in here, the wildlife populations have exploded down there. I can walk down the road and see a dozen rabbits just along the edge of the road. Uh, the first year after we did this, I saw the first quail since I've been there. And since then, I see them every year. This last two years, I've heard them sing. So they're coming back. Everything's coming back slowly. There you go. I had to steal this one from the internet, by the way. It's hard to get a picture of a quail. I got some, but they're like this big. <laughs> And again, we get start getting into the predators, the types of predators that are in the grasslands. I found this guy this year. Anybody know what this one is? I didn't doctor this picture either. That is a that is a blue racer. Have you ever seen one of these? I've never seen. That's the first time I've ever seen one around here. Yeah. Now I see plenty of black racers. Generally, usually these things are jet black. They have a pure white belly and they're jet black on the back and that's the first time I've ever seen a blue one. Our black, the racer wasn't, didn't have a white belly. They were black all the way around. Yeah. Oh yeah? Yeah. <laughs> now, is that poisonous? No. And they would chase the noise. They'll chase, chase the noise. anything. Yeah. One time they chased my stuff. mother down the hill. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to tell me a hoop snake story, are you? No. <laughs> she's told me plenty of them. She's from down Tennessee Mountains. But this black snake, She'd been up on a 
hill at the tobacco patch, and she was going home, so she just cut down over the hill. Well, there was a fence at the bottom of the hill, and that snake started chasing her, and she ran down it. She jumped. <laughs> you know how old. <laughs> But if you turn and race at them, they'll race from you. Oh, absolutely, they will. Generally, they'll run away. Uh -huh. Have anybody ever seen a venomous snake around here? When I was a kid, I water bucket. You have seen a copperhead? I'm smelling it. Smell, smell the cucumber smell? Yes. <laughs> I've never seen in 47 years, I've never seen a venomous snake around here. They're around here. Yeah. Now that, uh, and I was just talking to somebody the other day who was uh, kind of a herpetologist around here, and he said he's never seen one. Mm -hmm. they're, they're Where do you see them at? You see I them. think they're potentially copperheads are the only ones that might be around here, but they're down in Tennessee. No, there's plenty down in Tennessee, but in the bluegrass. The little spreading vipers are they poisonous? What's that? They're spreading vipers. Those little. Spreading vipers. I assume. I assume you're talking about a hognose snake. I don't know. They're about this long, and yeah. they look like a cobra. Yeah, those are hognose snake. No, those are absolutely harmless. In fact, you can't even probably get one of those to bite you. But they'll do that as a defense mechanism if we're talking about the same thing. They live in dense woods. Uh, yeah, yeah, and they like sandy soil. And I, you would think I would find them down here because there's a lot of sand because of the glaciers down there. And I've never. Uh, they must be getting rare because I haven't seen one well, in years. Well, I like now up in the woods. Yeah, under leaves. Yeah, you can find. Yeah, that you can find them like that. And uh, they're they're all different colors. Um, but they don't come up about that high. Yeah, but you, they will not bite you. You know what they hunt? You know what their main prey is? <laughs> toads. Really? Yeah. yeah, they like big toads. Um, they'll also play dead. They'll roll over and play dead. But then if you flip back over, they'll roll back over. <laughs> so they're, they're, they're a great snake, and they, they will not bite. They're not aggressive at all. But they do that for defense. Um, but these guys, if you grab him, they'll... They'll take you to the clean. <laughs> but Are they poisons? No, no. You, I, I would, you won't find anything venomous around here. If you do, it, it will be a copperhead. And I like, again, I, they must be very rare around here anymore. Yeah, water moccasins. Water moccasins? There's not a water moccasin within 400 miles of There's here. not. No. Those are banded snakes. water snakes. That's a, that's a, mm -hmm. I hear that all the time. And he calls the same thing. They um, no, them. they look, they look similar. They're, They're about four foot long. Yep, yeah, fat. Yeah. Always around the water. Those are harmless. Uh, very aggressive if you grab one, but but they're not venomous. <laughs> water moccasins are are far western Kentucky. Oh, are they? Yeah, there's a lot of wetland areas. Oh, call them that. Yeah. Do so you refer yeah. to you can smell it? You said a cucumber smell. Yeah. That that's the that's the story. If there's copperheads around, when you're you smell right cucumbers. There, you smell cucumbers. Yeah. You better stay away. <laughs> <laughs> and you wonder why kids are afraid of snakes. <laughs> down at the Bullitsburg Baptist Church mm -hmm. where the old part, the original part of the church, mm -hmm. they had some there and when we clean once a month in that really hot, no air conditioning, place closed up, you could hear them dropping off the old rafters back right. in there and that's what they always, they, those were copperheads because they had caught some. Mm -hmm. and that, but this is years ago. I yep. was down there yesterday. Where are those people? I would, if you ever hear of one, I'd love to see it. I was telling him about that, that chicken pool. Okay. And, of, and of course, one of the apex predators of the wood edge around here in, in, is the uh, red tailed hawk. Mm -hmm. That's actually not a wild hawk, that's a, it's a captain. My buddy of mine is a falconer, so okay. he was out there one day hunting rabbits. I let him come out to hunt rabbits. And uh, believe it or not, the habitat works great because he dived about six times and never got one rabbit. So, <laughs> that's the benefit of having good habitat. You know, when a, when a rabbit's out in a, in a mowed lawn, it's pretty much a sitting duck. So. And of course, we're kind of winding down here, but again, the, really the point of Split Rock Conservation Park is, is to provide opportunities for people to learn about their own natural resources, um, particularly children. Um, but again, I, I, have, I have had anywhere from infants all the way up to senior citizen groups come down and I'm happy to do it any time. Um, of course, it gives them the opportunity to explore in a natural native area and they absolutely love it. I've had kids in the wetland up to their waist, city kids from Covington. They, they didn't know any better. 
<laughs> haven't talked to adults much yet, so they didn't know they were supposed to be afraid. But just running through the water, giggling and laughing with gnats, catching frogs, it's a great experience for them. Uh, but we always try to set them up in that opportunity so they're exploring and learning on their own, they, and they don't even know. What I tell the kids when they get there, it's, this is like coming to school, but it's a really fun school and a really awesome classroom. So. <laughs> and of course, um, you know, probably a day before this, this kid has probably never told <clears throat> tell a snake in his life. So whenever we have a group down there, it's always an adventure. So if you ever get the opportunity, um, we'd love to have you down. We actually have our <coughs> fall fundraiser. Again, we're, we're supported by private donations mostly, so our fall fundraiser is coming up on October 3rd from 4 to 9, so if you're interested, um, we'd love to see you down there. And we got a great bluegrass band. By the way, they're playing, the downtown county bands are playing at our event, which are, I think, playing this Friday at Sheet and Branch, right? Excellent. What so. band is it? Downtown county band. Mm -hmm. A group of young guys from Lexington play, play a lot of bluegrass and music, so. Anyway, it's very formally, uh, um, it's a very um, family-oriented event, so if you get the opportunity to come down, we'd love to have you. So there's some contact information if, uh, if uh, you, know, you would like, need any more information. But anyway, um, that's the presentation. We'd uh, be happy to take any questions, um, if you have any, or if not. You know, they, I just recently, they took...